series on from passion to compassion. And <clears throat> over the three classes, this is the second interview is working. If you want to, okay, fine. It's okay. So we, I'll use using one driving metaphor for all the three classes which we'll have today, tomorrow, and day after. That how do we understand compassion, or how do you understand compassion? So, Prahlad Maharaj uses a well-known verse from the seventh canto, which the Prabhupada would often quote. Nahi bo dvije paradharatte yavai daranyas padvirya gayan mahamrita magna chitta ha choche tato vimukha chita sa indiyarthan maya sukhaya bharamutva hato vimudhan He says that, my dear Lord, I am not worried about how I can transcend material existence, how I can overcome worldly illusions. Why I am not worried? Because I am absorbed in your glories. Instead, I am worried about all those people who are caught in material existence chasing its illusory pleasures. So, in the material world, we are driven by the forces of illusion because they create within us a feeling of deprivation. The forces of illusion make us feel, oh, you know, this person is having so much wealth, this person is having this much, this person is having this much, and they are all enjoying so much, I am not enjoying. And this feeling of deprivation is what drives us. Chase this, get this, buy this, watch this. So, Passion means that we feel deprived and that we chase after worldly objects. So even when we have Krishna with us, we feel that, oh, I need this, I need this, I need this. And in that way, we let ourselves chase after one thing after another. So passion is a situation when we feel deprived. Whereas compassion is the consciousness where we feel that others are deprived. We feel that Krishna is so wonderful, Krishna Bhakti is so wonderful, that others who are not having Krishna Bhakti, they are actually deprived. And therefore, let me share this with them. So passion is a state where we feel deprived and compassion is a phase, a state where we feel satisfied in Krishna and we feel others are deprived. And so we uh, try to share Krishna with them. So this is basically the journey. How we move from feeling deprived even while practicing Krishna Bhakti to feeling that others are deprived and wanting to share Krishna Bhakti. That is the journey from passion to compassion. So. <clears throat> In today's session, I'll talk about how, how passion in terms of craving for material things is undesirable and how we can counter it. In tomorrow's session, I will talk about how we may practice bhakti also in passion and how we may share bhakti in passion. In the yoga. And in the last session, I'll talk about how we can practice and share bhakti with compassion. So the mode of passion is described by Krishna in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is Prakriti Traya Unbhaga Yoga, that the three modes of material nature. And there he says that the characteristic of the mode of passion, 14.12, he states. Lobha pravritti rarambha karmanama shama spruha rajasye tani jayante vridhe koru nandana. This is lobha. Lobha is greed. I want this, I want this, I want this. Lobha and pravritti. I, I should do this, I should do that, I should do that. This craving to get things and then the working according to that. Arambha, great and never forgetting it. 
karmanam ashamahaspruha and even if one gets something after working still ashamahaspruha the desire remains insatiable the desire doesn't go away it doesn't decrease rajasya etani jayante this is the characteristic of the mode of passion viruddhe kurunandana arjuna understand it like this especially this is the, the character since the mode of passion becomes prominent dominant in our consciousness now anchila prabhupad came to america he sang composed the markine bhagavad dharma song and there he says that rajastam gune rasabai achan vasudeva katha ruchi nahi se prasan this is all people are covered over by the modes of passion and ignorance and because of that they are not able to appreciate the sweetness of krishna bhakti so shri prabhupad is talking about not just that the material mode of passion living in it causes distress but it also makes krishna bhakti seem not very attractive and that is the greatest uh, sp- spiritual danger of the mode of passion so materially it just indentures us to endless labor and spiritually it makes us feel that krishna bhakti is tasteless so <clears throat> now the word passion can also be used in a positive context say so, i have a passion for art i have a passion for reading so passion basically means a strong attraction a strong deeply felt attraction in the bhagavad gita's philosophical context when we use the word passion it refers to the mode of passion the radajo guna wherein it each of these modes have their own characteristics is sattva guna rajo guna tamo guna one way we can describe these three modes are that some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened <laughs> <laughs> so the people in goodness make things happen they think and then they act and they get things done some people in passion they watch things happen if they want to do one thing but in doing one thing they are not very thoughtful that one thing leads to some other untoward consequence and they deal with that and they deal with that hey what is happening what is happening what is happening is watch things happen and people in ignorance are so uh, paralyzed that they just wonder what happened what is going on just don't see uh, so another way of understanding this there are two faculties we have the faculty of thinking and the faculty of acting so we think in our inner world and then we act in the outer world in the mode of goodness thinking precedes acting first i think then i act in the mode of passion first i act then i think he speaks of hey, i should have spoken that why did i speak that so we first we act and then we think and in the mode of ignorance we neither think nor act <laughs> so krishna defines this that uh, he you know there are three modes 14.11 he says the characteristic of the mode of goodness is prakash sarvadvareshu dehesmin prakasham upajayate jnanam yada tada vidya viruddham satva vidyuta so he says when all the doors to the body are illumined by knowledge by light the light of knowledge then that state is the mode of goodness now the doors to the body are the senses now this does this mean that people who are in the mode of goodness light comes out of their eyes light comes out of their ears <laughs> not like that now when it is illumined prakash prakash means light but when you talk about light of knowledge so for example if this door is there and if around that door everything is dark 
then I will not know who is coming in, who is going out. Sometimes a thief may come in. I will not even realize it. You know, uh, uh, some child whom I am supposed to take care, a child slips out, I won't even notice. So if there is darkness, then what is coming in, what is going out, we can't know. So similarly, in when there is no illumination in the door of the senses, then uh, what to take in with our eyes or what to do with our actions, that there is no clarity. So we eat without discrimination, we talk without discrimination, we see things without discrimination and that is a state of a lower mood, lower mood, either passion or ignorance. In goodness, when there is the illumination, then we can see, okay, and this person looks like a dangerous person, I will not let them in, close the door. So like that, we process the sensory inputs and decide what to allow inside, what to not allow inside. So Prakasha, illumination is the characteristic of the mode of goodness, Krishna says. In the next verse, 40.12, he says, Pravrutti. Pravrutti is action. Person in the mode of passion is defined by action. They just can't sit peacefully. They do keep doing something or the other. Action, action. And beyond that, Krishna really talks about the mode of ignorance, a prakasho, a pravrattisha. Pramado mohaevach. There is no prakasha, there is no proper illumination, and there is no proper action also. There is what? Pramada moha. There is intoxication and illusion. So, for example, a person may sit and uh, think and study and understand. That's say the mode of goodness. Person is involved in passionate sports. Sometimes people get into physical sports where they're slamming into each other, knocking each other down. That, is, that kind of physical running around thought, that is in the mode of passion. In the mode of ignorance, people just sit on a bed and play video games. <laughs> <laughs> and in shooting images in the video games, they think I am a big hero. So actually, there is neither thinking nor acting, there is simply illusion. So, in the mode of ignorance, basically there is what we can say, not even material action. So, there is uh, even materially imagine I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. So, when people watch, when people go and watch movies, now usually. And watch movies, maybe there's an action scene, there's a hero beating up some healers. I'm there, I'm beating up that person. The hero and heroine are uh, dancing together. People may, if I was there, it would be so nice. We'll start whistling. So, what is happening? This is actually eating, sleeping, mating, defending. They are considered uh, the activities are common to humans and animals. So, when animals, when humans do only those activities, that is considered animal life. But getting compulsively obsessed with entertainment is not even animal life. It is second-hand animal life. <laughs> that means the people are not even working to get the bodily need, the bodily desires. Just imagine and get it. And so many times when people go and watch movies, uh, they take something like popcorn and pop it, eat it. Why? Because everything is imaginary, something has to be real. <laughs> <laughs> so, a prakasho, a pravrittisya. In the mode of ignorance, there is neither proper action, nor is there proper illumination. Somehow, there is some groping for enjoyment. <clears throat> then, if you broadly understand these three modes in this way, <clears throat> Shri Prabhupada writes in a in a 40 chapter purport that in the past progress was understood in terms of the mode of goodness. Now progress is defined in terms of the mode of passion. So as I said, that prakasha or illumination is the characteristic of goodness and pravrutti. Action is the characteristic of the mode of passion. So one of the first books 
that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sri Thakur wrote was in Bengali called Bengali Samajikta, Sociality in Bengal. And there he addressed some of the criticisms of British people who had come to India. The Indians are such lazy people. You know, you know no material, no ambition, no progress. Just so apathetic. So he addresses that criticism by telling that actually we human beings have two faculties. There is the karmendriya, the working senses by which we act in the world. And there are jnanendriyas, they are the knowledge acquiring senses by which we observe and learn. So he says, in the western civilization, which is largely in the mode of passion, the stress is on the karmendriyas. Do this, do that. Do that. Whereas in the Vedic civilization, the stress was on the Gyanendriyas. Observe, learn. So he said the sages in India compose huge literature. The Mahabharat is 110,000 verses. It is 110,000 verses is actually it is seven times longer then the two of the longest poems in western literature iliad and odyssey both combined together multiplied by seven is less than the length of mahabharat so so how could lazy people have written something like this it obviously requires hard work but the sign of progress in vedic civilization was that how much we observe the world and learn was in terms of Jnanendriyas, acquiring knowledge. Whereas in the Western civilization is in terms of doing things. What have you done? What have you done? So, so he says that from the perspective of the Jnanendriyas, uh, progress in the Jnanendriyas doesn't seem of much value. On the other hand, from the perspective of the Jnanendriyas, Progress in the Karmendriyas doesn't seem to be of much value. Because the basic reference points are different. Krishna also talks about this similarly in 2.69 in the Bhagavad Gita. It says, Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam Asyam Jagrati Sanyami Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani Sanisha Pashyatamunehe. So he says that that which is Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam. That which is night for all living beings, asyam jagrati sanyami. That is the day for the sanyami, for the self restraint. And asyam jagrati bhutani. <coughs> that which is day for all living beings is night for the self realized. Now, this verse, if you take it literally, what does it mean? One creative interpretation we could do is when it is uh, day in India, it is night in America. <laughs> <laughs> and when it is day in America, it is night in India. So we could say that you know, all, all self restrained people are in India and all self gratifiers in America. So, <laughs> so when it is day for the self gratifier, it is night for the self realized. I mean, the day for the self realized it is night for the self realized But the Bhagavad Gita is not talking about in geographical categorization like that. Uh, so here, the words day and night are used not literally, but metaphorically. Day is the time of illumination. Night is the time of darkness. So when it is said, this is the day for the self realized, I mean, this is where they see things clearly. This is where they want to act. This is what is they look forward to. Whereas night means, so the self-realized, they want to get deeper understanding of life, of the purpose of life. And thus they want to move forwards. So that growth in our understanding is what they look forward to. But the, but the why, but the, the materialistic people, what is this? You know, what is the use of the self-realization? What are you doing? How much money are you earning? What are you achieving in life? That's their focus. 
So, oh, so conversely is also true. But just think of thing, oh, you are achieving this, you are running here, running there. What is the point of it all? And Srila Prabhupada met Ambarish Prabhu. Ambarish Prabhu is Alfred Ford, a great grandson of Henry Ford. I was just in Alachua, so I met him in his family recently. So, he likes to tell his first meeting with Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada came, when he came to me, he was in Detroit, and Prabhupada came there. So the devotee is introducing me. So he's, he's Alfred, the great grandson of Henry Ford. So Prabhupada looked at him deep in the eyes. He says, oh. So you're the great grandson of Henry Ford? Where is he now? Where is he now? So what Prabhupada meant was he had so much wealth. But now he has gone to some other destination, the wealth is left over here. So he told that. When I heard Prabhupada say this, I realized Prabhupada is a real saint. He's not interested in my money, he's interested in my spiritual well-being. When people are very, very wealthy, everybody around them walks on tiptoe. I don't want to offend you. So when people approach them, we want some donations from them, then we try to flatter them. So Prabhupada was not interested in that. The Prabhupada usually wants, yes, there is wealth, but it is temporary. So, where is he now? We may have a lot of wealth, but how long is it going to last? Things may belong, but for how long? <laughs> Things may belong, but for how long? So when we see this from the long-term perspective, that those who are self realizing what is this infatuation? Why are you getting so mad after this? The wealth is needed for living. There's no doubt about it. But wealth is a means for living. It is not the purpose of living. It is what we live with, not what we live for. In, in the materialistic worldview, Wealth becomes the purpose of living. The more money I have, the more successful I become. And then I want to become more successful and more successful. And what does that mean? I want to earn more and more. So this is the difference in the worldviews of the materialists and the spiritualists. So now, when a person is caught in the mode of passion, the desires just keep growing. That karmanam ashamahas pruha, insatiable desire. Get one thing, ten other desires come up. Get those ten things, hundred other desires come up. And it's an endless process. People talk about a rat race. Rat race, you know, they say, we want, even if we win the rat race, we still remain rats. <laughs> no, no, the thing essentially changes. Achieve one goal and then as some other goal to achieve, some other goal to achieve, some other goal to achieve. Oh. <clears throat> when I was a student in India, since my early childhood, I had one dream. I wanted to be the topper. And I was always among the toppers. First, second, third, sometimes the joint first, but I was never the first. So, I used to study for my exams and I was looking for, but never, at first rank would always elude me. And finally, in my third year of engineering, I give GRE. And at that time, because I liked English from my childhood, one of my hobbies was just to pick up a dictionary and memorize words. So, I generally Indians find it difficult to do well in English. So then when I gave GRE, at that time it was out of 2400, I got 2350 out of 2400. Not only was I first in my college, but I was the first in the history of my college. And the first in the whole state of Maharashtra in that time. I was in the seventh heaven. I was elated. And that lasted. It was exhilarating. But after some time, I realize, just looking at the marks, there is no pleasure. 
It's only when someone comes and congratulates you. Ah, yes, I done something special. So somehow it happened that three of my friends forgot to congratulate me. <laughs> <laughs> so first time it happened, second time it happened, and third time it happened, I was so agitated. I says, don't you know what I went you? Why not congratulating me? <laughs> so at that time, so it's almost like uh, I look at myself from above. My body, not a physical out of body experience, but a conceptual. <laughs> and I realized that at one level I was annoyed with them why they're not congratulating me. But then it struck me this achievement has actually not made me happy. It has made me more dependent for my happiness on others. In the past, I could just meet with my friends and talk with them and move on with life. Now, with them, when I meet them, there's so much expectation. And when there is no, that expectation is not fulfilled, there is agitation. So I've not become happy. I have become more dependent for my happiness on others. And that's when it struck me that there must be some other way to happiness. I can give another exam. I can work very hard. And I might achieve something higher also. So, but till what point? Again, the same thing will happen. I achieve something, again I'll depend on others for congratulation, for felicitation. So where can one get satisfaction internally? That was somehow the time when Krishna arranged that one of my friends who had been much more materialistic than me, he gave me a Bhagavad Gita. He gave me the Bhagavad Gita. The first thing I told him, he says, please read the Bhagavad Gita. I have already read it. <laughs> okay. But then as I was talking with him, I saw that he was so transformed. I felt maybe I missed something in the Bhagavad Gita. So let me read it again. And that's how I started reading the Bhagavad Gita. And then I understood about how at the level of the soul, there is happiness that doesn't depend on anything external. In 6.20 to 23, in the Bhagavad Gita, he talks about the state of Samadhi, of deep absorption. And there it is said, Yam labdhva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tataha yasmin sito nadukkena guruna pini chalyate. So 6.22 Krishna says that, Yam labdhva, having achieved this, na, Yam labdhva chaparam labham. That there is no other gain to be achieved. Manyate nadhikam tata. And yes, means sthito, being situated in the situation, in this state of consciousness. Dukkhena gurunapi navichar. Even if great distress comes, one will not be agitated. One will not be disturbed. So Krishna is telling here, the state of spiritual absorption, once we achieve it, there is no more further hankering for something more. And there is also no Krishna is saying not that there will be no problems, but he's saying there will be no agitation. The problems won't disturb us. So I started thinking, whatever I achieve in my life, will it ever can it provide these two guarantees? After achieving this, there is nothing more to be achieved. At the material level, whatever we achieve, that guarantee can never come. And whatever we achieve, can we say, this is going to protect me. So after I get this, I will never be disturbed by anything else. No, it also can't come. It's only when we internally connect with Krishna and realize our eternal identity as these blissful parts, that's when this will happen. So, this is the truly worthy achievement which we can pursue. This doesn't mean that we have to stop pursuing externals, but those are not what is going to make us happy. They are part of our life, are part of our profession, we pursue them. But our ultimate goal has to be this. So in the mode of passion, we just keep pursuing one thing and another thing, and we hope it will give us pleasure. And it gives us pleasure, but it 
pretty short lived. And when that pleasure goes away, you just find it so unbearable. I want more pleasure. And in this way, in the mode of passion, <clears throat> there can be actually two strong pullings. One is enjoyment, and the other is achievement. Achievement is also for enjoyment only. By enjoyment, I mean essential enjoyment. You eat this, touch this, do this. That's enjoyment. And achievement. No, I want to become great. I want to become number one. I want to get this gold medal. Now, both of these are desires driven by the mode of passion. And both of them promise some pleasure. But that pleasure is short lived. Shri Prabhupada explains that as far as the mode of passion is concerned, in, in sense enjoyment, most of the pleasure is in the anticipation of the pleasure. Oh, I'll get this, I'll get this, I'll get this. I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy. Most of the pleasure is in the anticipation. Suppose somebody is in a desert, lost, and their throat is burning. They desperately want water. And then they look up and they see a helicopter coming. This, about the signal for rescue, they find the helicopter just coming to them. As they look at the helicopter, they see on the side of the helicopter is written W A T E R. They feel so much relief. The helicopter lands in front of them, and after landing, a person in uniform comes out, tall, hefty, well built, and on the uniform, on the sleeves. Both is written. W A T E R. <laughs> no, I want water. And then they have a big jug carrying the jug, they come out. And that also W A T E R. And then the person approaches this. And this person he just pulls his fingers, please give me water. And then he puts his hands forward. And then the person takes the big jug, turns it around. And one drop of water comes out of it. And the person walks back, gets in the helicopter and goes away. What? <laughs> so, uh, so one drop, what was he going to satisfy? So sense pleasure is like that. This huge hype. Oh, I'm going to get the pleasure. I'm going to get the pleasure. I'm going to get the pleasure. But actually, when the pleasure comes, it is so little. It is so little that we just can't believe it. And then people think, maybe I am doing something wrong. Maybe I am with the wrong person or maybe I don't know some techniques. I have to do this, I have to do that. Some way people try to explore. But it is, the pleasure is only in the anticipation. There are, Prahlad Narayana verse, he analyzes, is there pleasure in material existence or not at all? Sometimes we may say there is no pleasure in the material world. But then we may say that, yeah, when I eat good food, there is some pleasure. When I see some beautiful sight, there is some pleasure. When I hear some nice music, there is some pleasure. So, Prahlad Maharaj says that Kutra Shisha Shuti Sukha Mrigatri Shvirupa Kvedam Kale Varama Shesha Rujam Viroha Nirvidya Tena Tujano Yada Piti Vidwan so he says, Narasimhadev is asking him, please, O oh Prahlad, ask for some benediction. And Prahlad replies, My dear Lord, what benediction can I ask for you? Kutra Ashish. Why are there so many enjoyable things? He says, These are all Shruti Sukha. Just hear about the enjoyment. But when you actually try to enjoy it, Mrugatrush Nirupa. It's like a mirage. There's no pleasure there. Somebody says you have got a young, healthy body. You can even if you're not enjoying right now, later you can enjoy. The body is a breeding place for diseases. So what enjoyment can you get? But in spite of knowing this, even the wise people are not able to give up the pursuit of sense pleasure. Why? Kama nalam 
madulavai shamayan durapai the karma it is like a fire the desire is like a fire which burns within us but madulavai there is a drop of honey a drop of nectar over there and that is so intoxicating shamayan durapai it just becomes it is very difficult to get it but still it is even more difficult to give it up insatiable so the same words he say two things he saying it's like a mirage mirage means there's no water at all but the same words he is saying that madulavai that there is there is a drop of nectar over there so what is it so actually the illusion is not about the presence of pleasure there is pleasure in the material world the illusion is about the quantity of the pleasure the pleasure is there in sense enjoyment but it is very tiny is where it lasts just for a few moments it's over but the mind imagines it's going to be endless so this imagination of the mind is what causes agitation and so these two the drive for achievement and the drive for enjoyment these two define the mode of passion that i want to be the top i want to be the number one and i want to get all the enjoyment i can and in this way the soul gets caught or swing one thing after another after another after another and there is you just can't when you are pursuing a particular pleasure if you don't get it it's very difficult to accept that you have made a wrong decision so i pursue it more i'll get it next time i'll get it next time but when the little pleasure comes along with that a lot of craving comes so <clears throat> i once wrote a poem about this so their hearts are pierced by desires hearts are pierced by desires their minds are filled with fears when we have desires and the desires whether we fulfill it or not it all that causes anxiety fear their minds are filled with fears they are on the verge of tears they are on the verge of tears and they say cheers <laughs> <laughs> so in materialistic civilization actually people are not happy but they somehow try to put a facade i am enjoying because the ego doesn't want to admit that i made i made some wrong decision so yeah i did the right decision i just have to work a little more so till then i'll put on a facade but actually there is no enduring satisfaction some fleeting pleasure is there it comes and it goes and not only does the pleasure go when the pleasure goes in the pursuit of the pleasure there is so much entanglement that results by entanglement we don't just have to refer to karma some people may not say i don't believe in the law of karma i don't believe in future consequences but still you know we may not be caught we may not be caught for our wrong doings but we will be caught by our wrong doings caught for our wrong doing means we do something wrong and some external authority punishes us for that but caught by our wrong doings means those actions themselves entangle us that means <clears throat> somebody takes drugs so yes no if they taking some illegal drugs the police may catch them and punish them they are caught for their wrong doings so sometimes they may not be caught say i am i am clever enough i won't be caught but if they are taking drugs each time they take it the desire becomes stronger and stronger and when that happens they are caught by their wrong doings the desire itself is binding them krishna says in 16 chapter that asha paash shatair bandha in 16.12 he says that materialistic people are bound by hundreds and thousands of desires these are like shackles 
They like nooses, they drag people. Now, almost all over the world, slavery is reproached, condemned. Even if it exists somewhere, human trafficking is there, but in general, slavery is condemned. So people are mostly free. They're physically free, but still there is slavery, there is bondage at the psychological level. Psychologically, people are bound and they are being increasingly bound. I suppose this is the home of a, this is a house where, say, a hostel where two students are staying, and this is their college. And in between, there is, say, a drug joint where now one of the students is born in a cultured family, they say, I'm never going to take drugs. And that student just goes by. No, no thought, no agitation, just goes peacefully by. But the other person has taken drugs and is shooting again. So whenever this second person passes by that drug joint, what happens? Maybe I'll go and drink, take some drugs. No, I've got studies to do. I've got to go to college. No, I want to drink. I want to take this. So there is, there is this tug of war that goes inside. So what is happening? As that person goes by that drug joint, that craving is there. So that's like a bond. The bond, the bond between the person's mind and the drug, the sense object. And it pulls, pulls. And if that person keeps indulging, then after some time, you know, if the, he doesn't even have to see that drug joint. As soon as that person comes out of the house, the mind is already in the drug joint. Even if somehow that person goes to the class, studying in the class, oh, I could have taken that drug. The mind is still there. There is psychological bondage. And when somebody becomes an addict, you know, addict means and the first thought that they get after waking up is, I want to take a drug. And the last thought before the sleep, I want some drugs. So addiction is actually a perversion of devotion. In devotion, we always want to remember Krishna. Addicts remember the object of their addiction constantly. But whereas remembering Krishna brings peace and joy, remembering the object of addiction simply causes agitation. So even if somebody doesn't uh, believe in future life or future karmic consequences, we can see the consequences even now. We may not be caught for our wrongdoings, but we will be caught by our wrongdoings. The wrongdoings create desires to do that wrong again and again, and they bind us. And it's a state of great distress. So at an external level, those who are in the mode of passion, they may seem to be enjoying life. But internally, there is no satisfaction. There's only agitation. I want more, I want more, I want more. So the result of the mode of passion, Krishna talks about this in the he takes uh, in 14 chapter 15 16 verses he says that each of the modes gives a result he says karmana sukruta syahu satvikam nirmalam phalam rajasastu phalam dukkham agyanam tamasa phalam so phala the fruit of each of these is karmana sukruta syahu satvikam nirmalam phalam in the mode of goodness if someone acts the result is purification nirmala that is the mode of passion, rajasas to phalam dukkham. Living in the mode of passion leads only to distress. Dukkham. And then agyanam tamasa phalam. If somebody is in the mode of ignorance, they are already in ignorance, but they go into deeper ignorance of it. So the mode of passion promises pleasure, but it leads to distress. And the more one goes into the mode of passion, the more one becomes distressed, the more one becomes entangled more and more and more. The mind just gets consumed, this desire, this desire, this desire. And how do I get all of this? So when the desires start consuming us, then they torment us internally. And externally, the person may be wealthy, may be prosperous, may be successful, but the desires are uncontrolled, and they are pulling, they are tugging, and it's great pain because of that. Sometimes you people who are successful, 
they do something crazy they may people who are fabulously wealthy still they do some scam to get more money and then they get caught and they lose everything so why did they have to do that because greed is tormenting them pulling them do this earn this do this and it just makes them miserable and they do something terrible afterwards so in the mode of passion although there's an appearance of prosperity appearance of success but internally there is great dissatisfaction there is great distress and the greatest marker of this is that people are at the level of the mind extremely agitated at the level of the body especially in the first world countries there's a substantial amount of comforts but at the level of the mind there is enormous agitation and that's why the professionals like psychologists psychiatrists they are flourishing because people are so agitated so disturbed that they need some relief in fact the whole uh, antidepressant drug industry it started in 1960s before that throughout the history of life people have had problems <laughs> but it is people in the past would also have a depression but in 1960 this idea of antidepressant drugs started and now antidepressant drugs are the single biggest drugs that are sold in the world uh, in the first world countries the maximum expenditure is on those drugs only. it's interesting sometimes they do world happiness surveys and different countries come first Now, happiness is of course very subjective so there's sometimes countries like switzerland so sweden denmark uh, switzerland this netherlands this come first uh, on in some parameters different people do different ways but it's curious that the people of these countries they say they are happy but these countries also have among the highest sale Uh, of antidepressant drugs so i say i am happy but i need to take antidepressant drugs then where am what is the happiness actually so if we just let ourselves be uh guided only by pratyaksha pramana seeing only with our eyes then we we'll think oh there are big buildings there are posh cars so these people must be so happy yes there is some happiness but if we see deeper at the level of the mind there is great agitation and that is unavoidable in the mode of passion because when there is this desire the desire is one thing that agitates the mind get this get this get this get this but concomitant with desire comes fear because when we want things which are out there and if because the things out there are not always in our control so if those things go away then that causes fear now we may think that oh if i have more money then i'll have more control i'll have more security but then the problem is i get money i seek money to gain security but then money itself is not in my control the stock market may crash anything can happen so desire and fear these two drive the mind wild and in the mode of passion these two are unavoidable so externally how much money one has how big a house a person is staying in how great a car a person has all these are fine they are markers of success at one level but they are not necessarily markers of happiness it's it happiness will depend on what is the state of the mind if the mind is driven by desire and fear there cannot be happiness and this desire and fear which drive the mind wild they can be calmed ultimately only by krishna when you fix the mind to krishna in devotion and the desire and the fear subside
So without Krishna, no matter how much one achieves, we will, we will, be, we will, we may, we may even imagine I am successful, and the world may lord us as successful, but happiness will elude us. So the more of passion, as I quoted from Lal Maharaj, he says, "Maya sukhaya baram udvahato mudha." This bhar burden, we carry a burden which the whole world thinks. Oh, you are so happy, but it is Maya Sukh. That is not actual happiness. Udvahato Vimudha. Mudha is a fool. Vimudha is an empowered fool. <laughs> empowered fool means what? Person has a lot of energy. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. But through it all, there is only the burden. There is no real happiness. So that sense of deprivation that we may have. When in the materialistic materialistic culture we say, oh, this person has this, this person has that, this person has that. And we feel deprived. I don't have all that. So I'm unhappy. Yes, if we have the capacity to work and earn and get material things, that's not the problem. But thinking that these things will make me happy and thinking that because I don't have these things, I'll not be happy. I'm not happy. That is the mistake. Because how much we have, how little we have. That doesn't determine our happiness. Our consciousness will determine our happiness. If I have little, but my mind is not wild by desire and fear, I'll be peaceful, I'll be joyful with it. If I have a lot, but my mind is wild with desire and fear, then whatever I have, I will not be satisfied. The classic example of this is the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Hiranyakashipu and Prahalad. Prahalad was a child who had nothing. In fact, his life was being threatened. But he was peaceful. Hiranyakashipu had everything. But he was not satisfied. He was agitated. He was dissatisfied perpetually. So by using Shastra Chakshu, with the eyes of scripture when we look at the world, then we will see that life in the mode of passion is not a life of happiness. It is a life of distress. When Shri Prabhupada came to America, that is what he saw. He says, he saw that actually that all the people here are distressed. It's only they hear about Krishna. Then when they become connected with Krishna, then that distress will go away. So that is a vision Shri Prabhupada saw with the eyes of scripture. He did not see big buildings, fast cars, smooth roads. He saw all that. But he saw something more. He saw the consciousness. And he saw it's filled with more of passion and ignorance. That's why there is the satisfaction. So to the extent we study scripture and we ourselves learn to see through Shastra Chakshu, through the eyes of scripture, then we will also see that this passion, passionate living, is not the way to happiness. And we will not get captivated by the illusion. So, broadly speaking, we can say that the eyes are the way to illusion. The ears are the way to enlightenment. The more we look at the world with the eyes, I have to get this, then I'll be happy. I have to get this, then I'll be happy. But the ears are the way to enlightenment. The more we hear scriptural knowledge, the more we contemplate what we hear, then see, and this is not the way to happiness. There must be some other way. And that's how we can perceive it. So the first step in moving from passion to compassion is to recognize that passion does not lead to satisfaction. It leads to tribulation. And that understanding that passion leads not to satisfaction but to tribulation, that comes through Shastra Chakshu, through seeing with the eyes of scripture. So in tomorrow's session, I'll talk about how <coughs> bhakti is the solution to the distress of passionate living. But more importantly, I'll talk about how the mode of passion can misdirect even our practice of devotion. And thus, we may practice bhakti with devotion and we may share bhakti also with devotion. With practice bhakti in passion and share bhakti in passion. And that can also cause distraction. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. 
I talked about the first part from passion to compassion. I talked about how passionate living doesn't lead to happiness, but leads to distress. And <clears throat> the three modes, characteristics I described, that goodness means first there is thinking, then there is action. Then passion means first there is action, then there is thinking. And ignorance means there is no other thinking or acting, they are simply imagining. So like people playing video games, watching movies, and just living in that. Doing that as an entertainment is one thing, but just making that as life's greatest pleasure. It's, it's not even animal life, it is second-hand animal life. So in the mode of passion, it's characterized by action, not work. Mode of goodness is characterized by illumination. So those who consider knowledge, acquiring knowledge as a sign of progress and those who think acting, doing things here in the world as a sign of progress, that's the quintessential difference between you could say Western civilization and Eastern civilization or, or broadly speaking, material civilization and spiritual civilization. There has been spiritual even in the West and there has been material in, even in India also. But the... Krishna talks about that his night for all living beings is day for the enlightened. So night and day refer to the area of interest, area of illumination and area of action, contribution. So we try to see from the perspective of the self-realized why they are not interested in passionate activities. So in passion we may achieve, I talked about the two main sources of pleasure. Achievement and enjoyment. Now, even if we achieve, I talked about my getting GRE, good score. That even if we achieve, there's always the dependence on others to laud our achievement. Only then there is pleasure. Otherwise, the achievement intrinsically doesn't give pleasure. And it's just an endless task because always we can keep achieving, keep achieving. So real achievement is that which gives us freedom from hankering and freedom from distress because of external disturbance. That achievement will come only when we become internally connected with Krishna in devotion. The other is enjoyment. In, sense, in material life, um, in sense enjoyment, most of the enjoyment is in the anticipation. Like a person lost in a desert, getting a helicopter with water coming, but giving only one drop of water. So there is pleasure in the material world, the illusion is not in the existence of the pleasure but in the quantity of pleasure. Feel there is so much but actually it turns out to be so little. And that little pleasure also comes at a big cost. Even if you neglect the future karmic consequences of wrongdoing, but still we may not be caught for our wrongdoings, we will be caught by our wrongdoings. That means whatever actions we do, they create desires within us which bind us. People may not be bound through physical slavery now, but there is a huge amount of psychological slavery. People are bound by their desires. At the extreme, we can say there are addicts who break their lives to somehow get the substance of addiction. It's like a devotees remember Krishna constantly, addicts just compulsively remember their object of addiction. But at a lesser level, uh, at a less extreme level also, people who are externally very successful internally they are tormented by their desires and that's why even when they have fabulous wealth they do something criminal to try to gain wealth and they fall because of that so as long as the mind is going wild because of desire and fear how much we possess that is not going to, going to determine our happiness we may have little we may have a lot but if the mind is wild with desire and fear that there is going to be distress. So the way to happiness is not just to increase what we have externally. It is, it is to free the mind from the forces of desire and fear. And that happens when we fix the mind on Krishna and become purified. So devotion is the way to satisfaction, not material accumulation as is impelled by the more of passion. I talked about how in the material world, there is the facade of happiness. Their, their hearts are pierced by desires, their minds are filled with fears. Their hearts are filled with fears, their minds are pierced by desires. They are on the verge of tears. And they say, 
Cheers. <laughs> so, if we stick to the eyes and see with the eyes, then we'll fall into illusion. But if we hear with the ears and then look at the world, then we'll see that the passionate light actually leads to distress. And therefore, we will get a strong conviction to rise above this passionate view of living. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any are there any questions or comments? Yes, from yeah. Thank you for a very nice class. So I think it looks like there is some similarities from your class from last night and today. Yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering about the happiness when discussed like that. They could be genuine, like when when you're talking about controlling the mind and playing in mind and having. There could be some genuine fear of physical pain. So not just imagine. Correct, yeah. There could be a fear of genuine physical pain. Yeah, right. So that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end is when it comes to happiness, sometimes it's easy to get carried away from the rewards of your own services, even if it's performing Krishna consciousness. So there's one spectrum where there's fear of pure pain. Mm -hmm. And the other spectrum will easily get carried away from our own rewards. So how is this two things? Carried away from our rewards means what? There could be some rewards or recognitions or something that happens within the services within Krishna consciousness. Okay, that I'll talk tomorrow. Hmm? Or uh, practicing some devotion, we are practicing passion. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But uh, so you may say, is that all our fears are they simply caused by our desires for craving and losing? But can there be not the fear of genuine physical pain also? Like uh, disaster. Yeah. Disaster. Yeah, I agree. Like I got your question. Yes, there can be definitely. See, in the mode of goodness when we live, there is also happiness. And in the mode of goodness, also there is fear, there is healthy fear. So, so it's not that when I say material world, the illusion is in the quantity of pleasure. There is pleasure at the material level also. So if somebody has a passion, but not in the sense of rajoguna, but a deep attraction. Somebody say loves science and you want to do scientific research. Somebody is a musician. And just want to go deep into music and absorb themselves in it. Somebody loves art. They spend hours doing some work of art. So they get pleasure over there. That, that is not Rajasik pleasure. If, if somebody does something out of love for that thing, not so much for the result that I'll get by that. The result comes. But if somebody does something in the material world also out of love for that thing, there is a deeper satisfaction that comes. So that is to a large extent in the mode of goodness. When we do something out of love for that thing. And the problem with that is also is that it is temporary. But it is not passionate. So similarly in the mode of goodness, uh, just as one can find more enduring material happiness. So in the mode of goodness, one can also recognize more tangible material fears. So sometimes some people, they are terrified. What if my favorite team loses a cricket match? And that's the biggest fear of their life. Now, others may have fear. More, what if I get, uh, lose, what if my health gets spoiled or what if there's an accident or whatever. Now, that fear is actually good. If when I'm driving a vehicle, if I don't tie the security belt, the belt then there can be great injury. So to have that fear, I should tie my belt. That's a healthy fear. So <clears throat> the material is not false. The material is real. And being real, there is real happiness possible. There is real distress possible. The problem is that it is, in the mode of passion, it is disconnected from reality and it is very flickering. In the mode of goodness, it is more connected with reality but still, it is not connected with the supreme reality. Not necessarily connected with the spiritual reality. In fact, if you see in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna talks about the 20 items of knowledge, at that time, he says that the wise person sees 
जन्म मृत्यु जरा व्याधि दुख दोषानुदर्शन पर्सन सीज द डिस्ट्रेस ऑफ मेटल एक्सिस्टेंस बर्थ ओल्ड एज डिसीज एंड डेथ एंड दैट बिकम्स एन इम्पेक्टस फॉर प्रैक्टिसिंग स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ सो दैट फियर इज नॉट जस्ट इन द माइंड दैट फियर इज इट्स अ रियल प्रॉब्लम इन दिस वर्ल्ड एंड रिकॉग्नाइजिंग इट विथ ड्यू ग्रेविटी इज विथ वॉट विल एनर्जाइज इन आर स्पिरिचुअलिटी सो डज आंसर यू क्वेश्चन Yes, it does. But mostly we hear a lot about being fearless in devotion and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Now, is it that in devotion we are meant to be fearless? Prabhupada said that you know one of his regrets is that his devotees are not adequately fearful of Maya, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted that healthy fear. So there is. fearlessness because the devotee is absorbed in krishna and the devotee's fear is that i may get disconnected from krishna and therefore the devotee is very cautious you could say almost fear fearful of those things which may cause forgetfulness of krishna so so that means this fear is not so much a physical damage uh, a devotee may also physic fear physical injury but that is not so much just because the devotee is thinking i am the body and the body will get injured but rather the devotee thinks that this body is the means by which i am serving krishna if the body gets damaged how will i serve krishna therefore i want to take care of this facility so fear itself is not bad it is what the fear is for whether the fear is so that i can stay more connected with krishna or the fear is that i will lose those things which are giving me pleasure without any connection with krishna so ultimately everything can be used in krishna service so even fear can be used in krishna service so if the fear is fear intensifies our devotion to krishna and that fear is positive okay thank you yes madam thank you very much so our my question was about How the Vedya Kama or the getting addicted to certain things in learning? How should I actually you know, control the Vedya or how should I become more devoted to Krishna so that I overcome it? Okay. Yeah. So if the desire becomes uh, comes and becomes strong, how do we control the desire and uh, stay connected with Krishna? Yes. Sir. it is we cannot fight desire at the level of the desire that means if you say no i'll not do it i'll not do it i'll not do it i'll not do it the mind will slowly delete the not <laughs> i'll not do it i'll not do it i will do it i will do it <laughs> so <laughs> if our consciousness is simply focused on saying no saying no is never pleasurable it's only when we have a yes to something higher then we can say no to something lower so bhakti is not so much about giving up desires it is more about taking up higher desires so taking up the desire to serve krishna taking up the desire to hear about krishna to serve uh, to chant krishna's names share krishna message so when we fill our life with more and more positive spiritual desires then these lower desires slowly start going away so we can't battle desire at the level of that desire we have to create a higher desire just like say if somebody invites us for some thing at their house say i have this program come to my i let's come now we may not want to go at that time you know how do i say no i don't want to make this person feel bad so we may not be able to say no but in that time that same day there's some other program is there then we can say no i have to go for this program so i can't come <laughs> so when we have something to say yes to saying no becomes easier but if there's nothing to say yes to no why not <laughs> so that's why as we would we try to fill our life with krishna as much as possible try to take up commitments in devotional service 
so we can't empty our mind of desires but we can crowd out desires we fill uh, we fill it with other th with krishna conscious things with positive things related with our services our responsibilities with krishna then gradually those desires go so that, that's the first thing second thing is when the desires come at that time we need to have some ready some readily accessible means by which we can direct our consciousness towards krishna that means when the desire comes at that time it's very difficult to remember why i should not do this because the desire comes and allures very strongly so if we at other times we may remember there are many times when i say that when i'm giving class you know, it's so easy to remember the philosophy <laughs> but when the temptation comes it just always the philosophy is forgotten so it is that so we have to make sure that that it's like you know how otherwise i sometimes feel it is like sometimes there are some warriors who fighters who they they exhibit their skills you know so when they are exhibiting the skills they are taking all their weapons and showing it and fighting but on the war field hey, wait i forgot my weapon <laughs> and now the enemy will slaughter at that time so we have to have our reasons okay why I, i don't want to do this i have that ready with us so it's not that illusion attacks us in unlimitedly new ways all of us have certain specific certain weaknesses and those weaknesses keep popping up again and again so what are our reasons why i don't want to indulge we write it down not just shloka what the shlokas mean to us what is it that convinces me write it down 1 2 3 4 whatever reasons are there and keep that ready maybe in a phone in a diary and read that that basically we need to resist when the desires come at the level of the intelligence and at the level of the mind at the level of the intelligence we get rational reasons philosophical reasons this is why i don't want to do this at the level of the mind because the emotions are involved over there it's the craving is there so we need to find some devotional stimuli by which our emotions are directed towards krishna so it may be some particular kirtan it's so sweet i love this it may be a particular uh, darshan of krishna particular picture this is so nice so then as soon as we look at it as soon as we hear it our consciousness gets directed that way and then if our both our intelligence and our emotions are channeled towards krishna then saying no to that desire becomes much easier and thirdly even if we indulge we should never even if we succumb We should not become discouraged. Okay, it happened. Let me rise and let me move on. But sometimes what happens is the mind is very cunning. What the mind does is first it makes us do wrong. So like say two people boxing match is going on. And the boxing one person bang he escapes a blow and this person falls back. And now when this person has fallen down, he has to he has to fight. and he should look at the coach or look at some of his fans or supporters you know what should i do the coach come on we can do it fight why did this person who has fallen down this boxer looks at the other boxer and says can i win this match never <laughs> so what happens is first we let the mind knock us down and then we consult the mind can i ever give up this desire never so what <laughs> so what happens is when you fall down okay i can rise but instead of rising the mind says you have fallen i fall down completely <laughs> so we never become discouraged that's why even if something has gone wrong we rise again and we need those who will encourage us so we never lose till we lose hope so even if we fall one time 10 times 100 times doesn't matter rise and keep practicing as we keep practicing bhakti gradually our practice of bhakti will make us stronger and as we become stronger then we will be able to overcome those desires last point i'll make is that we also have to recognize that past karma plays a role in this that just like the krishna has six opulences wealth fame knowledge beauty and 
so some people may look very beautiful some people may be very wealthy now this is a result of past karma similarly for some people by their past karma they have renunciation others don't have so just as just because somebody is more good looking than others that does not make them automatically more spiritually advanced yes if somebody is looks good then they will attract others and if they are going to speak about krishna people will be attracted and people will hear from them so just as beauty is a resource which can be used in the service of krishna similarly renunciation is a resource that can be used in the service of krishna but just because renunciation is there does not necessarily mean the person is spiritually advanced and does not and, and just because renunciation is not there does not mean that the person is not spiritually sincere of course by the practice of bhakti also renunciation comes but that is gradual so the point i'm making is overcoming desires should not be uh, our defining criteria for deciding whether i'm serious in spiritual life or not our seriousness in spiritual life is determined by whether i am practicing the positive activities of bhakti consistently or not the regulatory activities of bhakti all of us based on our past karma we will have certain levels of renunciation Now, some people may actually by their past karma be very renounced but if they become proud of their renunciation i'll talk about this tomorrow more then they are actually not uh, using the renunciation to remember krishna they are using the renunciation to become more proud you know just see all of them are fallen then they're not they're not making spiritual advancement sometimes we may fall but if we take shelter of krishna more then we may actually advance more okay so by trying to fill our consciousness with krishna by having both intellectual and emotional ways of redirecting our desires our, our consciousness away from that objects by never becoming discouraged no matter what happens and by understanding that renunciation is a resource for serving krishna if i have it good if i don't have it still i'll serve krishna that way we can combat desires thank you thank you very much so we'll stop here shri prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki itai gaur prema anand ji yeah